As Selena said, I'm Joe Hastings. I work next door. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Jamie. I've worked with Jamie since 1993, um, and our orbits have kind of crossed here and there since then. Jamie Bell began his career in formal, in, in informal science at the Exploratorium in 1985. He began working there as an explainer. Um, and by 1987 and through 1995, he ran the high school explainer program. Um, and that, that branched off into a Youth Alive, which went nationwide in terms of a youth development pro uh, program in science centers. After completing a master's degree in education at Harvard Graduate School in 1996, he returned to the Exploratorium to manage several projects, uh, including facilitating the framework, an exhibit and program development project based on California state science standards, and then also the con conception and development of two uh, exhibit projects. One of them is APE, Achieving Active Prolonged Engagement, A-P-E, Explore Terms, great with the names. Um, and those are some great exhibits, by the way, some of the best hands-on exhibits you'll ever find. If you, if you look for that book, Active Prolonged Engagement, it's a good one. Um, and then also um, Listening, Making Sense of Sound. Jamie has also worked as a consultant in the Boston area as the content developer for the Essential Science for Teachers, Physical Science, Professional Development video series with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics Science Media Group. Did you get all that out? It's a tough sentence, Jamie. Um, uh, but also, uh, a little easier to say, the Math, Momentum, and Science Center's project at Turk. Uh, in 2006, Jamie was invited to Malaysia to develop and establish a center of learning at uh, PetroScience, their national science center there in Kuala Lumpur. After three years in Malaysia, Jamie returned to the US to spend a year as a visiting scholar at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Learning in Out-of-School Environments, up close, uh, working with Kevin Crowley and others. And in 2010, he accepted his current position as the project director and principal investigator of CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education at the Association of Science and Technology Centers in DC. Jamie is a true lifelong learner and educator, um, as informal as they get as, edu as an educator, and he lives the philosophy that the best answer is often a question. He is an inveterate partner, collaborator, and improver of his organizations and the organizations he connects with. And I'm thrilled to introduce Jamie Bell. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity yeah, to be here today. I'm going to time myself so that I allow enough time for um, some dialogue with you all. Um, it's wonderful to spend some time with you. I worked earlier really today and I learned some things that I'm sure will influence the presentation a bit. So um, I hope I'm not too redundant with the things I said upstairs. So if I am, you just wait. So you already said that. Um, but uh, I'm here um, as the project director and PI principal investigator of a project called CASE, which is an acronym for Center for Advancement of Informal Science Education. And it's an NSF funded project that's based at, and speaking of long sentences, um, at the Association of Science and Technology Centers, which is the professional <coughs> association for science museums and centers um, worldwide. Actually, it's an international uh, professional association based in DC um, and put on a conference every year. You may have gone to the conference here a couple of years ago. I know I did. There were some wonderful hosts here who hosted, hosted that museum, these two and some guy who went back to Texas. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but um, so um, in, that, in that role, um, we uh, were housed at, at Aztec, this project, um, but uh, we work 100% of our time, when I say we, my staff, on this project called CASE. So we're not involved in putting on the conference. We're not involved in uh, the, the Aztec website, for example. We work with them very closely, but I always have to make that distinction because people always say, well, what's your relationship to Aztec? Uh, and we have a relationship, um, but we, we attend the conference like many of you do, actually as a client um, to some degree. Uh, we actually you know, have a booth there. It's a case booth, it's not the Aztec booth. You may have seen that. So um, that's the relationship, and it's a, it's a very uh, wonderful, a synergistic kind of relationship because, of course, 
that the science centers and museums are the, the anchoring kind of sector for this field of informal science education in the field. So it makes sense for us to be there. And it also makes sense for us to be there because the grant was written there <laughs> eight years ago, and that's the fiscal agent for the grant. Um, I also work with um, a few co-PIs around, co-principal investigators around the country uh, at um, uh, University of Oregon, John, uh, Oregon State University, I should say. That's, that would be a bad mistake. I <laughs> uh, Oregon State University, John Falk, um, uh, Kirsten Allen Bogan, who's now the CEO of the Great Lakes Science Center, um, Kevin Crowley, uh, my co-PI at, at University of Pittsburgh, where, as Joe mentioned, I spent a year prior to coming here. And Sue Ellen McCann, who's an executive producer at KQED Public Media in charge of the Quest uh, programming there, the Quest Network, which is also an NSF-funded project. And you see up there that there's, there's three staff and myself, and so we're, we're responsible for the, the whole project in terms of staff. Um, so uh, to advance, we're called advance, you know, the Center for Advancement of Informal Science Education. So what does it mean to advance this field, right? So I, uh, I always steal this line from one of our um, colleagues, who's I think colleagues, several people here as well, Dennis Schatz from the Pacific Science Center, who was at NSF for a few years recently and just went back. He said, you know, to advance this field, what we need is data, we need stories, and more important than that, we need relationships. Uh, and um, I, I really agree with those three components being what we need as a field to sort of advance ourselves because people don't know, sometimes understand what this, this field is. Um, Joe joked about me being an informal educator and one of my program officers at NSF always says, you know, the informal is in front of the wrong word. It should be in front of education, not in, part of, in front of science. Because people always go, if they're, especially if they're a scientist, research scientist, that is to say, a natural or physical scientist, they will say, well, what's informal about science, right? I mean, that's kind of insulting, right? So, um, but um, it, I think, you know, the idea that it happens anywhere, anytime, as Joe said, lifelong, life wide, life deep, to quote the National Academy's recent document. Um, uh, but um, the advancing really does require that we do have data about what's going on out there, what people are doing, and, and how they're being impacted. Um, by experiences um, from places like this museum and the one across the street and many others who are represented in this room and other providers of these type of experiences. But we need stories too because stories are very important and we need relationships. So all three of those things I'll try to um, weave into this uh, presentation a little bit. Uh, and the one thing that, um, we, that I particularly need that may not be so much in the presentation are also images. <laughs> Because images also help people. You know, you see those photos that like are on the first slide of people engaged in very, obviously, in a, in a pleasurable <coughs> way in experiences with STEM topics and, and natural phenomena. So, I go to the presentation here a little bit. So when the project first started, uh, my copy, uh, John Falk, did this sort of landscape study of the field to kind of figure out. He interviewed a couple of hundred people that he thought, he and his graduate students at the time, thought were sample, a good representation of the field of people who were doing this work. That was back in 2006 when they started it. This came out in 2007, 2008. And even some of what we call these different sectors now has changed over time. Um, and, but the, the whole point of this was to kind of develop this grid that would show, depending on which part of informal science education you're working in, the degree to which your goal was STEM understanding, actual understanding of content and process, and the degree to which you identify as an informal science educator. So it's kind of interesting at that time that people in Natural History Museum, Science Center, Zoos, and Aquaria very much identified that way, but people in other parts of what we would also consider the field then, um, through this survey anyway, this sample, uh, identified in different ways in, in, as to their roles. Um, and so I, I just give you that as, a, as an image of sort of where we started with the field. And one thing that's certainly true today that I'm sure you're aware of is that the number of different types of settings in which informal STEM learning happens now has expanded just exponentially. It's amazing. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those things. So case, in terms of a, a visual to how we position ourselves or think about ourselves. So again, we're funded by the National Science Foundation Advancing Informal STEM Learning Program, which is up there in the center. And the types of sectors, and I, you know, we use that word with a little bit of trepidation because people sometimes refer to the whole informal world as a sector and the formal world as a sector, and that's fine. We just use it as a convenience within the project to think about 
um, the different areas in, in which informal STEM education takes place. And that, that, you know, that happens in citizen science projects, it happens in museums and science centers. It also happens in, in film, it happens in after school, out of school time programs and so on. Um, our roles as we see them as a resource center for the field are to, we seem to like C's, and a lot of people I think do like C's um, for some reason, convene, um, connect, characterize, and communicate. So we bring together groups of people who are doing this work, um, who are professionals, um, typically from the different sectors. We try to have a lot of sector representation, so film producers, <coughs> developers, researchers, evaluators. Um, we try to con make connections between what people are doing, and then we, um, as a result of those kinds of events and, and gatherings, characterize what we think is happening in the field with regard to a topic. So if it's sustainability science, for example, is an area that we've had convenings on. Um, if it's an actual topic area, um, like nanoscience, for example, the, you probably all familiar with the, the nanoscale uh, informal science education network, um, or if it's a way of working like professional development. So there's a lot of projects funded by NSF that are the purpose of which is to do professional development for people in the field. And then to communicate those via our various uh, channels, um, the website, our newsletter, and, and other communication channels. Um, this, I'm going to spend a, a bunch of time today on the website and the repository, which is one quarter of our initiatives. The web infrastructure is in a, a site called informalscience.org. But we're also involved in evaluation capacity building, practice and research connections, and, um, and that, that has to do with practice in informal science education and research on that. So that could include a number of different social science research uh, areas like uh, learning sciences, for example, uh, and broader impacts in informal um, science education connections. So um, those are typically um, scientists, again, research scientists, who are working to develop broader impacts plans, activities, or they're working with their staff or directors of education and outreach to develop um, activities to address broader impacts uh, goals for their research <coughs> and their proposals. Um, so, the, the, as I said, the website is the key uh, repository for us, the key tool that we do all this through. And um, there's one thing I'm not going to do during the, the talk is to actually go in and out of the site because that would just take up too much time and be very distracting for you all. Um, however, while I'm talking, if you want to look at it on your phone or your iPad or your computer or you want to tweet or anything like that, that's fine. I'm, I'm used to that. You can, you know, you can have your head down like this and that's totally fine. Um, because that's the way things are in the world now. Which is actually a good thing, I think, for all of us, as, as long as, as there's some communication going on. But I say that because if you want to check out the site, it's better to do it that way. And, and um, there, uh, you can always talk to me afterwards about specific questions or, or write to me. And also, the network that I met with earlier um, uh, got a, a more in depth briefing on, on the site. Um, but we're always happy to do that on a, on a webinar basis or on a one on one basis. Um, so there's three types of uh, projects, uh, three types of resources on the, on the site. Project descriptions, research, and evaluation. So there's descriptions of a whole bunch of different kinds of projects happening in different settings, uh, as I mentioned, in all those sectors. Um, there's research on those kinds of projects. There's res foundational research that has informed the design of those projects, as well as the implementation of them. And um, then there's evaluation reports, everything from front end to formative to summative to remedial evaluations of those projects. Um, and there's right now there's, a, there's about 10,000 records on the site um, that span over the last 30 or so years of work in this field. Um, we don't have everything in the world that's there, but, um, but what is there is, is pretty rich and it's added to every day. So that we have a digital librarian who curates and catalogs uh, materials every day. Um, we rely on the community, people like yourselves, to submit things and tell us about things we don't have. So you, you play a big role in helping us um, uh, help, helping us strengthen this resource. Uh, there are also news posts, blog posts. The news typically has to do with upcoming um, funding opportunities, whether they be NSF or other federal funds as well as private fund uh, foundations, uh, and as well as professional development opportunities workshops in different museums or science communication courses in the UK or anything that comes to our attention that we think might benefit the, the, the field of people working in this, in this field. 
Um, and the newsletter which comes out once a month. If you join the site, here comes my big ask from the top. Please join the site. All you have to do is go to informalscience.org. You can do it right now. If you can. And, and join as a member. It only takes a couple minutes. If you want to fill out your profile, fine. You can do that over time. But once you become a member of the site, you automatically get the newsletter, and you automatically have um, access to resources there that you wouldn't have. There's a couple things that you wouldn't have access to if you're not a member. It doesn't cost anything. That's brought to you by the National Science Fund. Um, you can also, I won't go into much on this today, but you, it's possible to start a group on the site. And um, that means a discussion group of some kind, some kind of forum. And I can talk about that a little bit later on. Material. So the three biggest new things on the site, I should say those right up front, I mentioned these upstairs. Um, I didn't mention one of them. Uh, but I, yeah, I thought it might be more appropriate for the larger group. So uh, evaluation landing page, we recently completely redid our evaluation landing page. So you can click on evaluation on the home page. Um, all our evaluation resources organized in, I think, a very accessible, understandable way. That includes reports, but it also includes directories, handbooks, um, different, different tools, instruments, um, organizations that support and strengthen uh, informal science education evaluation. That's another thing. The Outreach for Scientists uh, page is on the home page also. You click there, and you can get into all the, the, um, the records in the, the repository through disciplinary categories. So sometimes scientists go, well, you know, I want to work with informal, but how they go to the site and they go, well, how do I find something that's related to, you know, I'm a material science scientist. Um, I, I, I need to find out what's been done in this field, what's been successfully done and for um, primary school students or something like that. And, and by the outreach, using the Outreach for Scientists landing page, you can get directly into your own content area first and then start to search for different audiences, different approaches, different strategies. The Research Agendas landing, the research agendas landing page has to do with some uh, research agendas that are happening in the field of informal STEM education. That is to say, groups who are trying to develop big questions about what uh, we need to know to do this work better, the grand challenges for the field of children's museums, or for zoos, or for natural history museums. There are people working in these sectors trying to identify questions that if we knew the answer to, we could all do better work and our audiences would benefit from. The Case Perspectives blog, every, every week on the site there is a new blog piece that tries to be, uh, we do our best to be current with current um, things happening in the field. For example, I mentioned upstairs, um, a couple weeks ago at AAAS in San Jose, the Citizen Science Association, which is now a formal uh, professional association, had their first conference. Uh, and it was a wonderful conference. It was actually, they were overrun by uh, members. They had 3,000 members online as soon as they established themselves. And they'd expected 300 people at the conference. They had 660 people at the conference. Uh, there was a lot of energy there, and we did three blog posts on it because we thought it was important to have a lot of sort of currency. So, but every week you'll see a blog post on something new in the field, and those blog posts will have links to records in our repository that we think are useful. Um, that's a little bit what the evaluation page looks like. Those categories and resources I mentioned at the top. There's also a guide to um, working, uh, using evaluation and working with evaluators in informal STEM education, arranged by chapters here. So you can just click on and go right to it. This is a book that Case wrote with, in cooperation with the Visitor Studies Association, in collaboration, I should say. Um, and um, if you want to just find out about the key elements of evaluation, this is more for people getting started, um, understanding theories of change, different aspects of developing the evaluation plan, proposal, and activities. Um, the resource, uh, the research resources I mentioned, they include peer review articles, um, connection to um, the research agendas I, I mentioned earlier, and then um, we have this thing called the evidence wiki. Uh, I didn't mention this upstairs, but under the research category, if you click on ISC evidence wiki, there are a number of short articles that are um, framed as evidence statements for what we know from evidence, whether it be evaluation evidence or research evidence about how people learn in these different informal settings. And what th that's intended for, um, again, a brief, easy way to find some statements that might support some proposal you're writing, um, or to have a, allow you to look up what's been done before around that particular area. 
So say it's girls and technology, or it's field trips. And field trips, by the way, is one of the most popular evidence wiki articles we have. There's one article there on the value of field trips. And isn't that a surprise? But the value of field trips is one of the most popularly downloaded articles. I wonder why that is, right? Um, I guess people have to look for reasons to justify field trips these days, right? Um, or maybe it's like reading about it. Um, so, so that's that. Uh, so again, please join the site. When you join the site, you can join a, uh, an existing group. And I'm going to say something about that today. This is also a limitation. Uh, we do forums in the group section of the group uh, of the site. And today we started a forum. And it's, on, it's called on shareable measures uh, in informal science education. And to do that, um, you need to go into the groups and you need to go to the uh, KC Valuation Initiative Forum group. And you can ask to join. We'll immediately say yes. Um, and you can join this discussion, which is about um, measures that are being um, shared across projects, or actually could be better shared in the future, across projects that are studying or evaluating the impact of informal science education experiences. So if you're in your project or your program or your exhibit, you are claiming that people are developing a stronger identity as someone who understands science or can use science, or you say that you're um, catalyzing motivation or curiosity, those are all things that people are working on in these pockets all around the country and elsewhere. And they're using sometimes the same words to refer to the same construct, but sometimes they're using different words. So this forum this week is, a, is, is an attempt to try to get people on the same page about, well, what do we mean by this identity, uh, motivation, perseverance, self-efficacy, all these things that we claim that we are um, uh, you know, evoking in people who are part of our experiences. So that, that's a week-long forum. I invite you to join it. And if you um, have any trouble uh, getting on, um, send me an email. We'll come, uh, email um, you, as I said, you can search all these resources. And you can find potential collaborators. Once you join as a member, then you can, search, you can look at all the members, search all the members. And um, if they have their profile filled out, you can tell what they do, and how they do it, and where. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about <coughs> networks because the Informal Science Education Network group, the New Mexico Informal Science Education Network, invited me here. And we have done some stuff, that is to say, CASE has um, done some work around networks. But I just want to give a real brief um, a few comments about my own experience with networks in this field. Joe mentioned youth a lot. Um, this, this is a network that exists still in regional areas around the country. Um, but it was a pretty amazing um, almost 10 year um, a network that was funded by the DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Fund in the 90s uh, that led to lots of professional development for people like myself, who at the time, as Joe said, was, I was running the high school explainer program at the Exploratorium. And um, for me, the professional development wise, this was a key um, uh, vehicle to connections in the field, to uh, greater knowledge, to skills in working with, with youth and science centers. And it was basically, a, there was a lot of discussion about how many museums were actually all ultimately in it, because there are still some that are in the regional networks. But originally, it was about 72 exhibits. And they were, uh, sorry, uh, programs. And they were um, organized as leadership programs. There were expansion programs and technical assistance programs. And all of this was developed by the Association of Science and Technology Centers in cooperation with the funder, who would have Reader's Digest. And it, so there were nine museums that had been identified as being really strong in serving youth, especially adolescents, 10 to 17, let's say, uh, in the country, that um, served as models, different models, mind you, because the Exploratorium one, and the New York Hall of Science one, and the uh, one in Evanston, Illinois, that I'm forgetting right now, SciTech, <coughs> they called them, all had very different models, but very successful in their own way. Museum of Science Boston was one also. Um, actually provided um, help to people who were trying to expand programs that had been started, but you know needed some ideas about how to get more uh, youth involved and how to serve them in a more quality way. And then there were also a, a third tier, which was called technical assistance, which was people who really wanted to start a youth program but didn't have one yet and wanted to know what was out there. Um, th this was a really um, key um, uh, initiative, I think, in the field that has had so many ripples since then. It's touched. You know, tens of thousands of youth 
as direct participants. And that doesn't mean you know, youth coming into the museum for a one-time visit and leaving. I mean, they were in programs where they worked as explainers, or they did volunteer activities, led lots of activities. They're putting very much in the role of, um, you know, a, a, a leader and a teacher in some cases, a uh, facilitator of experiences. So there's those, but then there's hundreds of people who are involved at the leadership level, whether they're program leaders, um, uh, you know, managers, uh, developers, those kinds of those kinds of folks who have gone on to do all kinds of things in the world, including one who's standing up here, um, and um, you know, directors of museums who were part of the, of the leadership of, of the of the program at that time. And um, I, the nice thing about it too is that there's actually uh, there's been some documentation and a retrospective look at it. Um, through uh, the lens of, of someone in Portland State in Oregon, Carrie uh, Snyder, who you may know from, uh, used to be at Lawrence Hall Science for many years, um, had wrote a paper with Meg Burke um, that sort of talks about the legacy of it, what it did, what, what the initiative did, and, and sort of where people are now. So that's an example of the type of resource that you'll find on the site um, that we hope to, um, is, a, is a rich one whenever you're thinking of a, of a new idea. So the, the object that the network shared, um, and I use the ob word object in a very general way, in this way actually, to say that what was in common among all the projects was they were working with youth, and they were working with youth 10 to 17, and they were typically targeting underrepresented youth in museums and science centers. And that became, of course, that's a, that's a fascinating topic, and it's a very challenging topic, but that was the content of the network. When we met twice a year for professional development activity, we were mostly talking about how to best work with that age group to get them engaged in science and STEM. We weren't using STEM then, but um, in science and in engaging the public in science and basically in their interest to, to stimulate their own interest in doing so. So um, that, that common sort of boundary object as it were became like this endlessly fascinating topic that could be looked at from a, not, a number of different perspectives and over the years, each year we had two meetings a year, one in, uh, at the Aztec conference and then one in the spring where we had lots of professional development opportunities and many people in the field now are you know, guest speakers like Eric Jolly who's you know, director of the Science Museum of Minnesota and um, lots of people came through that, that network and, and are doing interesting things. Uh, another couple of networks that um, I've been well, one particular I've really been involved with was on XNet at the Exploratorium, where I worked with Joe uh, and others, which is a very different type of network. Um, you know, one institution uh, running it, one science center, uh, basically the hub for it. And um, but interestingly, in this in this case, the content is the exhibits, right? So the exhibitions that travel around. And Joe and I were just talking for for the for the talk about how many. It was the upper limit we had at one point. So we had international members, or about a dozen, sometimes give or take, uh, members who received exhibits on a rotating basis throughout the year, I think every four months or six months, you got a new set. And with that, you got um, uh, also professional development. So facilitation on the floor, um, you know, how to work with teachers, how to work with various audiences from the perspective of the exploratorium. Um, it was really interesting to see the kinds of things that happen in a network like that when people um, are working with the same exhibits but at different times. And they get different ideas about how to use them and also in some cases how to extend them. So innovation happened often in terms of how people um, uh, use the exhibits and, and what they learned uh, from that and what they shared with them. Uh, what they learned. Um, the, the, another very different model, traveling the exhibits at Museum of Science teams, that was an NSF funded project where a group of exhibits came together, a group of museums came together to develop exhibits together. So they co-developed the actual exhibits and traveled them around to the museums in the network, about eight or so. Uh, and NSF funded that actually three times um, for, uh, to get, get started initially and then to further develop the model and to, and to do some research on it. I'm going to move a little more uh, quickly now. So in terms of case uh, with, with networks, so we we, that, when that works was one area, I mentioned we convened, right? So when we looked at the portfolio back in 2011, and we said, what are all these projects at NSF funding? What's some common themes here? A lot of people had networks, or were trying to form networks. I said, so what is it about that that's interesting? What can be learned from it? Um, so we went kind of through this process of first convening people in 2011, um, then at the follow-up PI meeting that year, principal investigator meeting, that, that discussion continued. 
Um, some of the networks are listed up there that we brought together that were funded, NiceNet, Living Labs, Quest, a uh, few I mentioned before. Uh, and out of that, this, of all the convenings we've had, this one so far has had the most legs. So I don't know what that tells you about um, the interest in, in networks is not waning, I guess. Um, but, uh, but people continue to propose the topic at Aztec sessions and pre-conference workshops up until this past year um, on this topic. And um, we try to continue facilitating that discussion um, through the website, uh, as well as an evidence wiki article that kind of summarizes a lot of what we learned through the project. Now, those wiki articles are submitted from the community, so it actually wasn't one of us who wrote it, but it was uh, someone who's a, an evaluator um, based in Chicago who wrote this article um, for the wiki uh, to kind of continue building this knowledge base on what we know um, about networks. The typical kind of things, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through these parts a little bit faster, but simply because being upstairs and seeing what's going on with this network, I realize you guys have probably been processing a lot of this kind of stuff, so I don't want to, you know, go into a lot of network theory and stuff like that. But, um, but there are things when you bring it together, a group of people who are doing this, and we have about 10 at the convening, you start to find out that there's these common issues. So, what, you know, what, what is the definition of a network? How is it different from these other things like consortia, partnership, strategic alliance, collaboration? Of course, there's a lot of overlap with some of them. Uh, what type of a network is it? Intentional, intentionally formed or organic, cultivated or cobbled to remove of existing people doing the same thing? Is it very top down, bottom up? Is there a central hub or distributed leadership, so on? So all those kind of things were talked about and, and kind of um, uh, embedded there. One of our colleagues um, who uh, some of you know, Sam Dean, who's now at uh, the director of the um, Amazium. In, uh, in Arkansas, um, it, uh, he came to the community and said, you know, the thing I learned is time, trust, and togetherness. And that, that seemed to kind of sum up what, um, what people uh, learned. And he was actually speaking about TechSmith at that, at that point, which I'll mention in a moment as an example of a network um, that, that spent some time together. All these kinds of issues, you know, the purpose of a network, you know, that, that the sort of shared purpose, that is it knowledge building? Is it about leadership? Is it transforming a field? Is it professional development? You know, as our, our evaluator, uh, Mark St. John, he says, getting better, getting better, um, which he actually stole from somebody. But it's a very good point um, and, a, and, a, and a good reason for having a network. Innovation, um, it's not a, it's not a uh, replacement for innovation. That it's not a, a guarantee of innovation to have a network. But innovation often happens in a network. As I mentioned in the, in the XNet, you, know, you have these exhibits going around, and people will get an exhibit, and they will think of something different to do to it that nobody else ever did before. And then sometimes that innovation spreads out through the rest of the network. Scalability is kind of, these days in education, it's all about can you scale it? It's working over here, OK? So that means we better scale it up. You never heard that before. Right? <laughs> um, we all know that the best things happen Globally, right? I mean, that's where it starts. It starts locally. And so there's this impetus, you know, you want to make okay, now we're going to scale it. Right? And that's, you know, it's not an easy deal sometimes. So somebody thinks it, it's more spiral building. You know, you go and then maybe something doesn't work, and you go like that, and then you finally maybe get up to the level that makes sense. Um, sustainability, I was at a uh, the Science of Learning Centers, which are resource centers, but very similar to networks, um, funded by NSF, but from a different um, division, uh, uh, the um, Social, Behavioral, and Economics um, Directorate. They met in uh, DC a couple weeks ago because they're at 10 years of being funded, and they're all kind of going, what are we going to do now? I mean, you know, I have a no-cost extension, but you know, how do I keep going? And maybe we should create a website. <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, there's actually some really good work is going on that is documented on their individual websites. But somebody said there, well, it takes 10 years to document that. Um, I think it does. At least this network stuff. Maybe you can learn it faster. Uh, innovation. So yeah, it, it, you know, you're exposed to new stimuli, but you also have to be willing to bring in new people. There was some talk about this upstairs about you, know, you have to seek out the outliers. That's what's going to bring a new idea in. Might not be comfortable, or they do exactly what you might not. You know, I'm not sure, but that's sometimes when the best ideas come from. 
Um, there's an accelerated feedback loop for ideas in the network because um, you know you can just bounce it off the members, and you, you know, if everybody's responsive, you can you can try out ideas and get things adopted quickly. Although there's this idea that came up, somebody did, did, did we, that sometimes this innovation happens in pockets, and you may not be aware of it. So you have whoever's the sort of coordinator, leader, hub needs to be aware of um, where the innovation is happening and make sure that it's communicated out to others. Um, and of course, the, the innovation manifests in products as well as processes. Um, the NISNET folks, how many people have been part of NISNET? Okay. Uh, NISNET's an amazing project, right? I mean, what's, they're speaking to me in their 10th year. Um, they, I'll, I'll talk about where they are in a second. But, um, but you know, they developed all this stuff, and these great kits and nano days, and uh, guides for working with scientists, and guides for scientists working with you know, educators, and all things fantastic, right? They spent a lot of time on those activities to make sure that they were good and tried and true and true. And then they get out in the world. <clears throat> Guess what? People do them differently than what they intended. Uh, and they adapt them. And you know, they combine what they run in NISNET with the CSI exhibit that they had from Fort Worth. You know, and there were stories like that, right? And actually, that leads to some wonderful things, right? Uh, but um, some, so sometimes it, it, it's not you know, the product, it, it's actually the process that people go through to, to develop, um, to develop uh, uh, learning, learning opportunities. So um, this is sort of the last one on this, it's just um, taking network management seriously. It came up, we were talking about this upstairs. You must have someone who takes it seriously, who maybe it's not their full-time job, but when they're on the job, They've got to really be overseeing everybody as much as possible uh, and making sure everybody's in the in, in the network, though, there's providers, consumers at various times. And sometimes someone who's a consumer for a long time steps up one day and guess what? They're a provider. Um, it just sometimes takes a while to figure out what your role is, what you have to offer. It's a very common phenomenon in, 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 in the field of this. But you know, to hear people say it from a number of different NSF funded networks was, was interesting. You know, there's innovation, but there's also integrity. So you do want some integrity about what you're doing, um, and not be saying, well, you know, we formed this network to, to innovate. So where's the innovation? You know, it's like uh, uh, Joe and I used to work with a physicist in Exploratorium who recently retired with Thomas Humphrey, and he used to always say, I don't want to be innovative. I just want to be good. <laughs> uh, and let someone else decide on innovative. Um, but but the point about that is innovation is wonderful, but you know, it's catalyzing it is is tricky. Um, and um, there's a, an integrity of quality that's just as important, if not more so, than some of us perceive innovation. Right? So there was that tension came up in the discussions at that meeting. Um, fidelity, brand, you know, for some of the networks there, like Quest, uh, KQED, um, it was really important to them that everything they did be branded as Quest. You know, it had to be branded as Quest. That's uh, maybe a function of the fact that it's a media outlet, and that's a you know, a pressure from their their organization. They have seven other um, media outlets around the U.S. that work in the same way, where they're they're in a locale, and then they have like 16 partners in San Francisco Bay Area that are either science centers, labs, um, other providers of experiences, or actually in some cases doing scientific research, but um, have a big outreach component. So um, branding is important in some networks, some others not. Um, and then there's this idea of things uh, disappearing, or the need, the need that the network was meant to meet, uh, the need that the network was meant to meet. That was hard to say. <laughs> that need disappears, and then what do you do? Right? You keep going because hey, we all like each other. We're friends, working pretty good, and you know, we get money and stuff. Um, sometimes the right thing to do is to, to um, close down, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, They're not organizations on the cheap. I like that. One of our consultants there said that. Uh, that is to say, networks. So, a couple of scholars that really influenced us. We gave out lots of readings for the convenience. The most popular ones were by um, Luis Gomez um, from UCLA. Um, and Rebecca Woodman, who's at U uh, U UMass Amherst, um, whose name used to be Gajda. So, you see a lot of stuff published by her under the name Gajda. Um, these were the most popular, uh, useful, so we heard from our participants, um, pieces. And actually, when Aztec was here two years ago, um, at the, does anybody, was it the pre conference networks workshop? 
Luis Gomez spoke there. This, uh, we, Case, actually invited him and, and sponsored him to come. And um, uh, his idea is uh, uh, getting ideas into action. He talks a lot about networked improvement communities. And it's a very rich body of literature. I'm not going to go into details about it now. But, um, but the idea is that you know we all have lots of good ideas, but getting them into action is really hard. And uh, networked improvement communities are, are a resource for doing that. But it involves lots of understanding of how things work. Like he talks about level A, B, C work. Level A is what happens in the museum on the floor with visitors. Level B is what happens within the museum to have everybody who's doing that be better at what they're doing through Wikipedia and stuff like that. And level C is what you do with your other museum and other parts across you know, the street or wherever, right? Uh, and then the idea about, you know, again, fidelity come up, it comes up in this work as a variation, I like to state, is a resource to be understood. It's something to be studied and learned from, not just know that's variation, it's not going to work here. So that's what I took from Lewis. Um, this is his, there, and he works with Anthony Bright and uh, Alicia Grinnell, so I mean, to write this stuff. And this is their plan to study act. You've never seen anything. Uh, and then Rebecca, um, you know, talks about, and I was looking at your old materials about, you know, these levels of integration, cooperation. Oh, yeah, we're all cooperating, right? And then you start actually coordinating your activities. Well, you guys are going to do this next week, so we're going to do that the following week. But then you start with, I got an idea. Let's do this together. I noticed that in yours, the material you all are using, there's, a, there's another level in there. It's called coalition. And I think that's very interesting. So I'm, there's lots of variations on these theories. Um, Maybe we can talk about what the coalition means in the, in the QA. So I really recommend her work, uh, Rebecca Woodland or Gajna. That's, oh, that, she talks a lot about, you know, the intent to share the purpose of, of a network. And uh, that's her little wheel. Um, so a few network, other networks to mention, just to where they are on their trajectory. So XNet was successful enough with that model of the Explorer Tournament leading something to get NSF funding to start a TextNet. So NSF funded a smaller network that was led by the Exploratorium and one of the uh, Texas Exploratorium XNet members to be like sort of two hubs for a, a smaller group intrastate uh, Texas uh, network. Um, lots of lessons learned. Um, exhibits that live on, program ideas, uh, still going. I was in Texas last week and, and uh, the director of the Laredo Museum was there and talked to her a bit. You know, there's, there's lots of rich uh, material that came out of it. The network itself doesn't exist anymore. It wasn't ran out of funding. Um, but it's, it's one that has a nice evaluation report um, that uh, you, can, you can find on the site. This is one that recently sunsets. Does anybody know about Coalition for Science After School? So they, you know, existed for uh, about 10 years as well. And just like, you know, they looked around, they put a lot of effort into a lot of events, a lot of resources, a lot of connections, the connectory, as I mentioned, that thing that um, Time Warner, uh, that was funded by Time Warner. And um, they decided, you know what, there's a lot of people doing this work now, and they're doing it pretty well, taking different parts of the landscape and running with it, so we're gonna sunset. So they actually had a Passing the Torch Summit. Does anybody read there? Um, anyway, they kind of said, we're done. We're going to have a meeting in two days. We're basically saying, thank you. Um, go forth. Do good stuff yourself. And they were also very smart to like make sure that their resources live somewhere. So we have all their history stuff on, on informalscience.org. Um, and so it's, it, it's interesting to go to that um, page and read um, about what they learned and, and uh, you know, in the process and where some of the, the current um, or the previous players, what they're doing now. Um, I, I want to mention one thing. I didn't put a lot of URLs in the, in the actual slides because in all the notes, everything I refer to is the URL. There's a whole list of URLs in the notes, so you'll have them there. I just don't want to have them cloud open. Screen, Portal of the Public. Who's a member of Portal of the Public? Great project, right? Work with scientists in your place. Network, <coughs> manual for how to do it. Um, growing network, expanding beyond science centers. Lots of good documentation, lots of good evaluation. Nice then I mentioned they're currently thinking about what they're doing next. They're going to have a big meeting in May. Um, the, the idea that this network was formed around a topic area is pretty, 
pretty unique in our field, right? 10 years on nanoscience, pretty amazing. Lots of amazing materials, lots of connections, you know, 500 plus members or, you know, at different levels. Uh, great reports, great evaluations, great approach to evaluation if you can't afford an evaluator. Uh, what do they call it? Um, Team-based inquiry. Team-based inquiry is a great way to evaluate um, a program or a project if you can't afford it, an external evaluator. Science Festival Alliance, um, growing network, really expanding. They have a uh, IPSEC conference. <laughs> Don't ask me what it is. It's, it's uh, International Public Events Science Something Conference. Anyway, it includes science festivals, but it also includes things like cafes, uh, all kinds of science events. It will be in May in Cambridge. But this thing, it grew in ways they didn't expect. They, you know, it, it says there, they grew, they tended to have six in three years, and they had 36 members in two years. Um, not all of them are at the same level where they're actually funded, but there are members, and then there are people who are sort of being mentored by members that means to say you want to start a science festival, you're in some city, anywhere in the world actually, and you can get help doing it. Living Lab, this is a, this is a great model. NSF um, really touts this model. It's, a, it's an interesting model where um, the Museum of Science Boston, I with the universities in the Boston area, where uh, researchers in early childhood learning come into the museum, do experiments on the floor. You, your family comes in and you child goes over and does something with some materials that have been designed to explore learning about a particular either uh, object, material, uh, spatial, spatial reasoning kind of a, a, a experiment. There's all kinds of experiments where um, you can actually receive a brochure and what's known about it. If you're a parent, you can go home and observe your child doing those kinds of things at home, all supported by the museums. Um, the museum staff and project around this, and they have partners around the country um, that are doing it in other cities like Baltimore and uh, elsewhere. Is anybody here? <coughs> Where's that? Science Center. Your certificate? Yeah. This is the mix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two things I want to slide, two things I'll say about network. Um, if, you, if you only have, because I was joking upstairs, everybody has tons of time to look at lots of websites and read books, right? <laughs> we all have time to do that. So, because you do, I was going to say, there's two evaluation reports <coughs> worth reading. One is this one, Navigating the Future of Actual Science. This is a, a five-year project where SRI in Palo Alto looked at networks, or what they were hoping would be networks, in actual <coughs> STEM programs in California. And they found some really interesting <coughs> things. Lots of missed opportunities, pockets of strength, but some really interesting issues about how people thought about partnership or didn't even think about partnership. There's an, there's an after school program across the street from a, the Army Corps of Air Engineers and a water facility with educators, and they never thought, well, you know, we could do this, we could invite them over. You know? I mean, there are things like that that, you know, um, it, it's very instructive in that way to read about what can happen, even though there could be a lot of rich, rich resources around. Um, what's, um, <coughs> There's supposed to be another one in there. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, say one more thing about this. Um, the reason I had this one in here too was because this is the other evaluation worth reading in terms of being a formative evaluation about networks. All the many of the networks I mentioned have evaluations on the informal science.org website, but because a lot of them aren't finished yet, they don't have summative evaluations. Um, but this one has a nice, um, some, some data that's being gathered. And um, it's, it's just really overwhelming to uh, try to make sense of 10,000 records on a website, right? Especially if it's at the limited time we don't have. So I, I mentioned to Selena that um, I brought in the form of the software <coughs> on my computer and a handout of the top 10 research papers and top 10 evaluation papers that have been downloaded from our site over the last year as well as like seven curated ones that we think are really, really worth the time to read um, that, that I'll make available for people that took that out and take. Um, I'm going to do one other thing real quick. Um, I, when I was in Texas, I was thinking, you know, um, what am I going to talk about support happening in the field right now? And I started thinking, well, making, you know, uh, citizen science. I started thinking about all these things that are happening. And so what I did was I said, for every letter of the alphabet, I could think of something that's important or trendy right now. I'm not going to go through them all, but what I did was um, kind of 
put them all on these slides, and then I said in the notes, there's a link to every single thing. So, activation lab, like for A, right? How many people have heard of this project? It's funded by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. I talked about shared measures before. This is a project to look at what activates a child to learn science. What do they have to have in their metaphorical backpack to be successful and persevere? So they've, they've been doing these studies in various Lawrence Hall Science University of Pittsburgh, a couple other partners. And they have a website called Activation Lab, and they have been, the research is at a point now where they're about to come out with some evaluation tools. So it's something to know about um, that may produce, again, some ways to think about how you're measuring what's happening in your programs. Active prolonged engagement. Joe mentioned the Explore Touring Project. One thing that doesn't happen enough in this field, I can tell you from where I sit, and we get a lot of things submitted, it's researchers and evaluators. Researchers and evaluators. Researchers and evaluators. Sir, I love all these people. They're all, many of them are personal friends. But not enough practitioners write about what they do. If you do, a, if you do a program, you're a program leader, designer. If you could possibly make some time to write in a reflective way about what you do, that is really, really important. That's why I think that book is great because it's got you know seven different exhibit developers who say, I was trying to make this exhibit that showed you know um, square root. They used to have this exhibit that showed it, but I thought it could be done better if I just added this piece or made it bigger or whatever, and. Um, you know, and it explains everything they tried and how they worked with a researcher and did videotaping and then developed the exhibits and made them better. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. Anyway, I go through the whole alphabet here. I want to say one more thing, <laughs> sorry, because it's, it's on the, uh, it's under um, E here. Um, in addition to networks and centers, ecosystems of learning. So when the learning science and informal environments came out in 2009. Um, it's a very, you know, been a very influential book. The first time it was a consensus volume that kind of, kind of capture everything we know about learning in informal environments. Um, and it's been sort of the standard thing, like it's what everybody refers to in Surrounded by Science, which was the companion um, book that went along with it. It's getting a little bit old in some ways, right? It's out there, but there's been a lot of research since then. So there's been a lot of, and in that book, they talk about ecologies of learning. Right, so all these settings in which they're interconnected, sometimes not so interconnected, in which uh, learning happens. This is developed into this whole thing. People are talking about ecosystems now. So um, there's a couple of papers that are included in the, in the, uh, in the notes page here, um, funded by the Noyce Foundation, on ecosystems that have promise in different regions of the country, where the formal and the informal are working together in very intentional ways create experiences that are more coordinated, sometimes collaboratory, but more, you know, sort of cooperative, cooperative at this point. Um, but this is, this is something about, the um, topic also came up upstairs, about how to, to get in the door of the formal, right? It's like, you can try to get in the door, but you can also think about what is already in common. There's good practices happening in schools, there's good practices, good practices happening in formal settings. It's a matter of identifying those and trying to connect them. So there are a number of projects right now that are looking at ecosystems of learning. And one of them is a, is a, uh, was uh, funded by the National Academies a couple years ago. STEM learning is everywhere. And that, you can go to the National Academy site and get the entire uh, convocation uh, monograph for what happened there. Um, but the Noyce Foundation funded a paper by um, Saskia Trail and Kathleen Trapphagen, who's also an informal science by the way, that does a case study of 15 different places around the country where they think this is promising. And their findings, what they think it takes to do this, what kind of leadership, what the issues are, and what the recommendations are. So ecosystem is something I really see uh, on the horizon. But that said, um, as with any um, uh, metaphor or model, right? at that STEM learning is everywhere convocation. Carol Tang, is anybody with Carol Tang? She's now at the Creative, Children's Creative Theory Museum in San Francisco. Before that, she was a, a program officer at Bechtel. Before that, she was at the uh, Lawrence Hall of Science. Before that, she was at the California Academy of Sciences. She's very, a very smart um, scientist, actually, and educator. And she studied ecosystems as a graduate student, right? So she said, that's fine, but don't forget, an ecosystem consists not just of the top level carnivores, but also decomposers, <laughs> such as bacteria. <laughs> And sometimes the critical species in an ecosystem is not a sea otter, but a sea star. 
Similarly, similarly, a large or remote community organizer or leader may end up being one who sparks significant change. Also, ecosystems are not efficient. They fall over very long time periods and they constantly change. When we think about this work, we try to make it too easy and clean when we're losing the messiness that's inherent in the system and makes it difficult and social. Um, and I just like that as a way to think about you know, being attentive to all the different parts. And you know, sometimes they actually die away, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, things that aren't working in, in informal science something's going on new, like making it, it's real shiny. So there's a number of those, more of those alphabetical things in there, but you can you can just look at those on your own. So thank you very much. Sometimes works, but it's always usually that's why the convene part is really one key part of our role. Because we found that if we have an in-person convening, even if it's only one on a topic, as long as we nurture that and cultivate that discussion, that can go really far. But you have to do the stuff after, you know. So I think it's key, and it also was mentioned upstairs, right? Another face-to-face thing is really important, uh, and of course it is. But you don't have to do it a lot. I think. I mean, my experience has been you can keep um, interest and participation in a topic or something going, but you have to really you know, keep cultivating things. And nowadays, people can't travel. I mean, NSF can't travel much. So. so it seems that a lot of the networks that you're talking about are more like community So some of them, like like, um, like I mentioned before, so the way they did it was just like, well, we're going to be regional networks. And once they did that, then they could get local funding to have like the mid-Atlantic region. And, and sometimes that works. Um, does anybody know of any examples of, I forgot your name, you met, right? Oh, I'm not. Oh, no. okay, I have one that's, it's a long-term ecological oh, yeah. reporting network, which is going to run for like 30 years yeah. or four years. With funding. No, but their funding went away. And a lot of it got no. they got they self-funded for a long time. I mentioned um, upstairs, there is something um, in, under the bees, was broader impacts network. There's now a network, it's only been in existence since third year. Uh, National Alliance broader impacts. They have an NSF uh, grant that's in the category of an RCN, Research Coordination Network. Um, I'm not sure what all the requirements for that are. Obviously, they got one. But what that grant allows them to do is to have activities for five years. It doesn't pay anybody's salary or anything like that, but it pays for them to have summits. So it does get, have, you know, we'll talk about upstairs, it keeps that in-person thing going. So at least you know you can count on a summit every year. So that's, that's a route that that they used, of course, they, they weren't coming out of a, they weren't ending anything else they were starting, but that's what they started with. But it made sense for them to just fund the activity. So it's, it's a vehicle that NSF has. Is, has. Um, I know that some, you know, look at NISNET. They, they figured out how to transform themselves. Like they were a cooperative agreement before, but then they, they changed to a project. They just, you know, wrote a different proposal so that they could do a different thing with what they had been already been doing. Uh, but not have it be a cooperative agreement. So you can be creative with what the agencies offer um, to keep going, but it, it, you bring up the point. So at some point, you're going to be in a situation of, you know. And sometimes it's what, what survives is not the network, it's all the good stuff that happened, and that's okay. 
Um, and people do get used to like working with the same people and they want to keep working with them. And that's sort of a phenomenon. <coughs> And sometimes that could be good. I don't know of any other examples. Well, so locally, Celebra La Ciencia that had funding to do a lot of stuff, but one of the things was the state fair, and people still go to the state fair and have day, but it started with science. Celebra La Ciencia, I don't know if that's sort of the... And that was sort of a lot of the same players in the um, network here. Yeah. As you see in the collaborative council. Started and that was a network actually here too. Still is. Right. There's several exhibit uh, networks like the Wine Map, Science Museum Exhibit, Collaborative, Youth Museum Collaborative. I think they still exist in some form. Yeah. Partner finding and share exhibits. Yeah. yeah, you can't find, I mean, like I went for SMEC right you know, before I came to where this, I put it on the website or anything, but you know, like they know each other and they still work together. So I well, we started a nuclear science week six years ago. It's now grown into England and France and Canada. And, but it's, you know, keeping it alive is the same thing. Is it, is it a shared group of people talking about the same thing, or is it just struggling for funding enough to do something? I, I, I mentioned that you know, students and science started their own professional association. So that's also a way to go is to start a professional association community practice essentially people doing a certain kind of work and establish a 501c3 and membership and dues and that's a lot of work you can, sometimes that's that's the right vehicle Of New Mexico or state researchers that are specifically studying this in the Department of Education, College of Education, or outside of that? That are studying informal learning? Mm -hmm. I results here in town? Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyone besides Selena? <laughs> I'm just wondering about um, resources here in town. Right. Uh, yeah. There's a group called Apex, but they're for hire. They're local? Yeah, and APS has a pretty, and APS out in Kirk Public Schools, they have a pretty hefty research and evaluation group, but once again, how do you connect to that to get them to use them? You, you know, has anybody ever worked with um, Slow for a Minute and Sianzei? Yeah. Um, they, there's a guy, Peter Lynn, um, I don't know the slow run person, but they, um, they, it's called Audience something. They, they, they're in Santa Fe, and they, they, they do really great work. Um, in fact, one of their evaluations is on this top 10 list that I said makes you It's an evaluation of, a, of, a, of an art museum, actually, and it's one of the best evaluations I've ever had. Um, and Peter himself also runs something called Culture Cat. Has anyone heard of this? Um, he's, he's not the only one. And they, they put on a... Um, culture Kettle. Uh, did you hear that? No. Yeah, Culture Kettle, like tea kettle. And um, a couple of years, no, just two years ago, at MIT, they ran a conference called The Evolving Culture of Science Engagement. And um, they actually, and it, was, it was a lot of people from our field um, and other people in our field, uh, but also like you know Neil Tyson was there and stuff. So and they produced this document that is really really interesting about like kind of the, the new frontiers to think about engagement. Um, you know what are the, all the things that science centers sometimes aren't able to do because they can't be as nimble as small organizations or projects. And, um, it's, it's available, we have it on our website, but, but you can also go to Slogan Minutes website. And it's called, yeah, it's called, if you just search for the Evolving Culture of Science Engagement, it's a really good page. It's a really good report on an event. And he continues to be involved in that, so I, I don't know if he'll do other ones, but he's, you know, not that far away, so.
case to us here in New Mexico. I want to make sure everybody leaves me your email address. I'll make sure you get the notes from today's talk. And also, Karen, where are you? Karen wanted me to announce that she has many copies of the seasonal sightings, bird migrations along the Middle River Band calendar, which is really beautiful. So if you would like one of these, see Karen. <laughs> I got a whole bag of them. I got more in my car. <laughs> 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 